I want to thank you for attending today's home buying webinar. First Mark Credit Union is excited to bring this educational home buying webinar to you. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. My name is David Puente. I'm the home lending manager at First Mark Credit Union. And before we get started and I introduce our presenters, I just let me provide some information on navigating throughout the webinar. First, all attendees are in the muted mode and your cameras are disabled, so feel free to sit back and relax. To ask any questions throughout the presentation, you have access in the chat feature to type your questions at any time. We have already received several questions ahead of time and posted those answers. Uh, so we'll follow up with an email and, and post those answers with that email. If you don't get a chance to get your your questions answered at the end of at the end of the presentation, you will have uh, our contact information and are welcome to contact any of us at any time. We're here to help you. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent out at a later date. First Mark is credit, credit Union is excited to host this educational webinar for our membership. First Mark is a member owned, locally controlled, not for profit cooperative. We were founded in 1932 by teachers to serve teachers, all school employees, and their family members. Our common purpose is to stimulate savings, home ownership, and financial wellness for our members. Each quarter, we will host a home buying webinar to provide home ownership resources and education to meet your dreams of home ownership. So be on the lookout for more webinars to come throughout the year. <clears throat> Tammy Tapman is our presenter today and her current role in SWBC is Vice President SWBC Mortgage VA li Liaison. She is a military veterans community representative and certified Texas Real Estate Commission mandatory con continuing education instructor. As the former, former mortgage lender liaison and branch manager at the Texas Veterans Land Board for more than two decades, Tammy has been a devoted military advocate helping veterans to take advantage of their benefits and obtain low interest home loans. She has a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from the University mm -hmm. of Mary Hardin Baylor and a graduate degree in banking from the University of Wisconsin. As the VA Mortgage Liaison for SWBC Mortgage, Tammy develops accredited VA lending training programs for employees and real estate partners throughout the country. In addition to Tammy, we have two panel experts that will be answering our questions after the presentation. Let's start by introducing Amy Hyden. Amy Hyden is First Mark's lending partner who works at SWBC as our mortgage loan officer. Amy's been helping borrowers achieve the dream of home ownership since 2008. Since joining SWBC, Amy has ranked nationally as a top mortgage loan originator multiple times. Amy strives to be a lending partner that is available, approachable, knowledgeable, and dependable. She will walk beside you every step of the way from pre-qualification to closing. I'm also delighted to welcome Janine Edwards. Janine has been a licensed realtor since 2005 and received her broker license in 2012. She is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, graduate of the Real Estate Institute, certified residential specialist, and a KW luxury agent. She serves on the Keller Williams Agent Leadership Committee of the top 10% of KW Legacy for the past 10 years and a platinum top 50 finalist. Tammy, before I turn the floor over to you, I'd like to remind all attendees to type your questions in the chat feature and we will do our best to answer uh, after Tammy's presentation. Tammy, the floor is all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. So let's talk about the keys to your new home. I'm so excited to be presenting today um, for for um, many reasons, but hopefully you will be better prepared after having taken this class because that's what it's all about. And I just want to sort of say that First Mark Credit Union, we appreciate you. Credit unions having been in the business for over 40 years, credit unions are where you want to uh, where you want to go. They are designed to help their their members. And that is just such a great business model. First, we'd like to start start by asking you to think about the reasons that you wish to buy a home. 
Maybe you want the freedom to, uh, to decorate a house uh, the way you want to. Maybe you want stability, live in a certain school district or a certain neighborhood, provide security for your family. There are those that say that buying a house is a really good way to build wealth. And I am one of those people. Um, we have seen so much price appreciation at home. So it's a great way to invest in your future. Tax deductions. There are tax deductions available in the United States uh, where you can deduct all the interest that you pay on a home that you are declaring as your homestead. You can also deduct off of your taxes the property taxes that you pay on that home. There may be certain energy tax credits that you'd like to take advantage of, or maybe you have a home-based business and you have deductions that you would be able to take because of that business. Um, Regarding mortgage reduction building equity as you pay your payments, obviously you're going to reduce uh, your uh, loan and that builds equity and it's money that you're really sort of paying yourself rather than paying to a landlord that you never see again as you build equity in your home and we're going to also talk about home equity lines of credit in the state of Texas. Um, predictability, so I rented for about five years after I got out of college and every year when my lease would end, what would happen? It would go uh, to renew it, I had to pay more money and I didn't get more for my money, but um, so this is a great way to predict your housing expense. The capital gains exclusion is a really great benefit and reason to buy. If you own a home, to, if you own, if you occupy that home two of the last five years that you own it, you do not have to pay capital gains when you sell that house. Up to 200, a net profit of 250,000 for a single individual, $500,000 for a married couple. There's no age restrictions. You can do this every 24 months. Um, and then you can deduct from that uh, from that net gain that you got all of the selling costs and capital improvements that you made to get that house ready. I sold a house in San Antonio in January. And so all of those improvements, like the painting that I did to get the house ready for sale, the realtor commissions, all of that can come off the capital gains um, that you had and I can't really think of another investment that you could make where you don't have to pay capital gains so that is a wonderful benefit. Equity loans so in the state of Texas it used to be that you couldn't use your homestead as collateral to borrow more money. Well the laws changed in the 80s and you can currently uh, borrow up to 80% of the value of your home. So if you have a house, we're just going to use this $100,000 example because it's e easy to understand the math. So if your house is worth $100,000 and you've paid that first lien down to $50,000, then you can borrow an additional $30,000 on a second lien home equity line of credit. Uh, it's a great way to pull money out of your out of that asset that you own and you can use that money for absolutely anything that you want to use it for. You can make home improvements, you can consolidate your debt, you can send your kids to college, you can pay off medical expense, you know, go on a trip to Europe. Uh, and that interest that you pay on that home equity line of credit is going to be lower than if you charge that home improvement at Home Depot or you charge it on your credit card or got a bank loan. Now, you want to be sure and tax, uh, check with your tax advisor, but um, I am told that, that if you use that money for home improvements on a home equity line of credit, if it is for home improvements, that particular part of the home improvement of the home equity line of credit can be uh, uh, deducted off your the interest can be deducted off of your taxes. I had I had a home equity line of credit. It was great. I, I used it for home improvements and, um, and I got a really good interest rate. We know that buying a home is the largest and most important investment most people make. It sure is for, was for me. And to help that transaction go smoothly, you should arrange your financing first. And you want to use someone uh, like Amy that has a lot of experience and has a great track record. The first thing that you do before you identify a property that you wish to purchase is gather your information and get pre-qualified. And we're gonna give you a QR code at the end of the class. Um, you can scan that, you can go to First Mark's uh, uh, Credit Union's website 
There's a lot of ways you can get pre-qualified, but you really need to do that immediately uh, because in today's market, and I know Janine's going to talk about the current condition of the market, but there's a tight market, meaning um, there's um, uh, more home buyers than there are available properties. So one of the things that the listing agents, the agents that are representing the seller are going to be asking for is where's the pre-qualification letter? How do we know that this person really can do what they say they can do before they accept the contract? So you're going to need that pre-qualification letter to give to Janine so that she can um, submit that with your offer and sometimes they'll also want verification of funds especially on a house that is a high dollar house they'll ask for verification of funds uh, you'll get a closing cost worksheet from Amy which is um, just a rough estimate of what your closing costs would be so when you apply online Amy will get an email that tells her that you've applied online and that gives her a signal to um, give you a closing cost worksheet and she can usually get you approved uh, within 48 hours. Now once we get six pieces of information that requires us to give you a more accurate picture of what your closing costs would be, which is called a LE or a loan estimate and that six piece, those six pieces of information are your name, your income, your social security number so that we can get a credit report on you, your property address that you wish to purchase, uh, the estimated value of the property and the loan amount that you're asking for. So looking for your home, I can't stress this enough. Before you begin, you want to take time to assess uh, both your wants and needs. Um, I want to stop and think about what it is that you want. Do you want a three bedroom house and a two bath? You want a, a four bedroom house? Do you want a three car garage? Do you want a townhome? What exactly is it that you are looking for? And if you're, especially if you're buying a house with your significant other, you want to make sure you're on the same page. Now the research, I know that um, a lot of people do um, Zillow, but not all the houses online are listed, uh, uh, are really for sale. Uh, the best way to, you can go online and 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 define your research, uh, your search parameters. You can look at the Board of Realtors. The best way to get an idea of what's available out there is to talk to your realtor and have your realtor um, pull some, some sales for you, the properties that are available for sale. You can tell Janine what you're looking for, and then you can go online to look at those houses because all those houses that are online will have virtual tour tours, they'll have photographs, um, sometimes they'll have aerial shots that were done by drones that'll show you the property that is the, the way the neighborhood looks and the amenities. But that uh, uh, internet really minimizes your house hunting time. So driving the neighborhoods is very important. I think this is one of the most important slides in the entire presentation. Once you find a house that you're interested, you should go over there after work, drive over there after work and see what your commute is going to be like. What is the neighborhood look like? What are drive it during peak traffic times? Um, check for flooding. Uh, how can you check for flooding? Um, you can call your insurance agent. Um, your insurance, the, the company, the insurance company that you're you're paying your uh, car insurance to, you can call the agent and say, look, I'm thinking about buying this house. I'm wondering if you could maybe, um, here's the address on the house. Can you maybe tell me if it is in a flood hazard area? If it is located in a flood hazard area, 100 year flood plain as defined by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, then you do have to have flood insurance in order to purchase that home. So do it yourself or work with the realtor, or work with the real estate agent. So it's very beneficial. Um, Janine has been working with our company for many, many years, and she has a great track record. She, she is, you heard David say that she's a broker. So real estate agent versus a real estate broker. That means that's somebody that has been in the business for a long time, that has taken a lot of education, and has has uh, passed uh, an extra set of guidelines and tests um, to help you. So you want to use someone 
that is very knowledgeable um, about the real estate business. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And another thing about Janine that I like very much is she works for a company that's very reputable and she has a great reputation in the community. So when you are submitting an offer on a house and there's multiple offers, you want to work with an agent that um, has a great reputation because trust me, the listing agent uh, is not going to want to work with someone that they really don't know. So you want to uh, make sure that you are working with someone that you like that has a lot of qualifications. And in the blend realty that we offer uh, through First Mark Credit Union, all of those realtors have been scrubbed. They've had to have uh, at least three years in the uh, in the business. They have to be a full time realtor. And they also had to have to have a certain number of closings every year, which is very, very important because there are, I believe there's 12,000 realtors in San Antonio, for example, there's realtors that just do it part time and that's not really what you're wanting. Um, I think that there are so many benefits of using a realtor, but I want you to understand that unless you have a buyer's agreement with your real estate agent, they're not legally representing you. So, and the question I get a lot is, well, can I work with multiple realtors? Can I work with five realtors at the same time? Yeah, you can, but it's not a very good idea to do that. Um, and the reason is, is because you don't really have anybody legally representing you. So you wanna choose one realtor that you feel comfortable with, ask for representation, and that person can go to work for you, help, help you stay you know, stay on course and get the very best deal possible. Your agent can tell you so many Im really important things about your neighborhood, the schools, um, the amenities in that neighborhood, the potential for growth, the supply and demand in that area. How long are they going to be building out in this neighborhood, for example, if it's a new home subdivision? What uh, property is right for, for me? So you kind of want to stop and think about, do I want a new house? Is it important for me to have a new house? Would I like to have a condo because I really enjoy apartment living? Um, would I like a town home, existing home? Or, you know, do I want to buy a foreclosure and fix it up and maybe make some money later down the road? New homes are fabulous. I bought a new home and um, I actually signed the contract in December of last year and moved in this year in April. And it was, you know, very happy with it. There is obviously less maintenance. Everything is brand new, but, you know, things can go wrong, little things here and there. And so you want to make sure that you get a warranty. I had a, um, a loan officer that called me and wanted to know if um, the VA, for example, requires that there's a warranty. If you get a VA loan, you're a veteran and you want to get a VA loan, the builder has to be approved. You have to have a builder ID and they also have to issue a warranty. And so um, we would not be able to help that particular uh, person with that house because the builder was not willing to um, issue a warranty. So it's very important that you get a warranty on a brand new house. You want to ask what is included. Um, but there's a lot of new energy efficiency technology, security technology that new homes have. My house is a lot more energy efficient than the house that I that I just sold. Um, and I'm really enjoying my savings on the energy, um, the the electric bill. Um, a lot of times the builder will let you choose the colors, the upgrades. Um, your realtor is going to be negotiating the price and costs of that. Um, in today's market, I'm sure Janine will talk about this, uh, builders may be less likely to contribute towards the closing cost. Uh, we had in the Wall Street Journal uh, reported on this, we had a um, doubling of the cost of uh, lumber from $15,000 for average to buy lumber for a brand new house to $30,000. And that has kind of leveled out. It had to do with COVID and some other uh, sh shut the shutdown of those um, sawmills and so on and so forth. But costs are more expensive. And, and so what we're seeing in a seller's market, and if you're in a seller's market, uh, that a lot of times the builders might not want to let you uh, pick out the cabinets, for example, or the flooring. So every builder is going to be a little bit different and your, your realtor can negotiate all of that for you. 
You may have resale issues. If you want to buy a brand new house and you plan on selling the house in a year, and maybe houses are still being built in that neighborhood. In my neighborhood, for example, we're still, uh, we still have uh, uh, several hundred houses that are to be built in this neighborhood. Um, so we did have um, a credit union customer that bought a house in a, a new home subdivision, and the house didn't appreciate the way that he uh, thought it should. So you just want to ask Janine about the resale issues. Maybe there's certain neighborhood development area or in, in maybe it has a pool and maybe it has a park. Um, my subdivision has a really nice park and I'm going to just enjoy that so much. Reasons to use a realtor uh, with a new home. You know, you can go to a sales office uh, on the weekend and, and they can negotiate a deal with you, but the cost of a real estate agent is paid by the seller. It's never paid by the buyer. And so builders add in the realtor fee um, into the cost of the house. And then that realtor can negotiate for you if anything goes wrong. I mean, builders love realtors. They have a lot more stroke than the buyer does. And this is what they do. This is their profession. So um, don't be shy about using a realtor, even if you're buying a brand new house, because they can really help you. Condos, those are sort of like apartment type living spaces. You have no outdoor lawn maintenance that you're responsible for. You're, you own basically the, the space within those four walls, and they usually have amenities such as pools, clubhouses, spas, gym, gyms, tennis courts, but there's a monthly maintenance fee. And so you wanna be sure that you know what that maintenance fee is uh, before you sign any type of contracts and that information should be readily available to you. There may be some financing restrictions. Some condo projects haven't been approved by FHA. They haven't been approved by the VA. Um, and so you might not be able to get financing for them. Townhomes are attached properties where you own the land and the, the property. Um, there's less maintenance than a single family dwelling, but there's also less privacy. They usually have amenities, the same amenities that um, a condo would, such as a pool, clubhouse, spa, gym, tennis court. Um, and you will have a maintenance due, a monthly maintenance fee as well. Don't rule out an existing home. You might have a motivated seller that wants to, you know, that has maybe inherited the house and they want to sell it because they don't want to have to pay the taxes and the insurance. Um, they're, you know, they live in Chicago and they want to just unload it. Uh, maybe it's in an established neighborhood or community that has a really good school district or it has great landscaping or some type of unique architectural elements or quality workmanship that you really uh, like. The appliances and window treatments may be included in that uh, in that sale. It's very customary. I know my daughter-in-law uh, bought a house in Pflugerville, and the seller just said, well, you can just have all the window treatments, the curtains, the blinds. Um, you can have the refrigerator. As a matter of fact, you can have all the bath mats so, and the, the uh, shower curtains. And there is what we call a non-realty addendum that your realtor will get uh, completed that'll show that those were included in the sale. Maybe the property taxes are less in that uh, neighborhood. Maybe there's no homeowners association with no dues or maybe there's lower HOA dues, and that's a consideration. You wanna be sure that the realtor has provided you with the HOA documentation to show what what the um, what what are the guidelines? What are the restrictions? I know in my neighborhood, um, I really like the fact that I have an HOA because that protects me against somebody you know parking a junky car in their yard. Uh, it, the HOA is going to take action against that person, and but there's some little some little hoops that you have to jump through. I want to have some additional landscaping done on my house, and I'm going to have to have that approved through the HOA. HOA, the Homeowners Association. Repairs and alterations are likely if you are buying in a seller's market, meaning there's a lot of people competing against you for that home. Um, Janine or your realtor may say, you know what, we might not have as much room to negotiate the repairs, um, but normally in an existing structure, there will be some repairs or alterations that are likely and your realtor will work with the listing agent to try to negotiate those. You might just you know, if you're worried about getting your contract accepted, 
uh, your realtor may say, you will, let's just go ahead and take it as is, and that might tip the seller to uh, accept your contract. I know we have, uh, you know, a lot of engineers out there and people that are handy. I'm not one of those people, but uh, maybe you want to buy a fixer upper and buy it below market. Uh, but that does require, if you're buying a foreclosure in particular, that does require a lot of uh, preparation, patience, and persistence. And you want to use an agent, a realtor that specializes in foreclosed properties because you're usually buying that foreclosure as in as is condition uh, we had a gentleman that wanted to buy a house and it was a beautiful house it was a very expensive house uh, but the roof was not in in a good condition and it was going to be twenty eight thousand dollars to uh, put a new roof on that uh, to make it to where the uh, investors and the appraiser uh, would accept it uh, so we were not able to uh, make that loan because the property was not in good enough condition. Now we do have um, we do have products where we can do um, renovations, and um, so it just kind of depends on, how, on what's wrong with the house. But uh, another consideration would be tenant occupied evictions. You know, like if there's a tenant that is occupying that home um, and they're not paying rent. Are you going to have to evict them during COVID? You know, it's a, 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 the court system is pretty backed up with that type of stuff. How much would it cost you to evict the person? I bought a rental property and a guy was occupying um, part one side of the duplex and he played me like clockwork. But if he wasn't paying me, then, you know, those are considerations to think about if you do, if it does have a tenant. Liens and taxes. Um, when people stop paying their mortgage, then they, they stop paying their their taxes and their lien. In the, so they may have a lien um, on on the property for the taxes, or they may have a lien on the property for maybe they had some work done. This is something that we see quite often where um, a person has work done on a house. Maybe they had some renovations done, and they don't pay the contractor. Maybe they run out of money and they don't pay the contractor. That contractor is going to file a mechanics lien in the county where the property is located. And so if you're buying that house and there's a, if there's a mechanics lien that's been filed on that, uh, then that's going to have to be paid before the sale can be cleared. Uh, think about the repairs. How much is it going to cost to get this house up to snuff? Um, is that going to exceed your budget? So those all considerations and a realtor that specializes in foreclosed properties is going to know what the banks will and will not uh, do to get it uh, ready for sale. Now, another benefit of using a realtor is they can give you a lot of pricing and market market analysis, and this is extremely important. In fact, this is one of the most important slides in the presentation. How do you know that your offer is good that that's what you should be offering uh, because your realtor is going to be giving you comp comparable sales and those are also known as comps and those are properties that have just sold recently and they can give you a printout of the the proper the properties and within 90 days is what the appraiser really likes to see um, there may be some cash sales uh, that somewhere along the line someone has um, some information on um, maybe there's listings competition homes that are currently on the market but they haven't um, closed they haven't sold yet um, and then the third category would be contracts pending those are houses that are under contract but they haven't sold and so those that's really good information that you can gather your realtor can gather and give to you um, so that you're making an informed decision on how much you should offer so your ag agent's going to negotiate the price of the house who pays for what the cost the timing of the contract and then the option period so option periods are a period of time that you pay a nominal fee uh, 100 200 dollars um, the bigger the house the more expensive the house the option fee uh, might be more and, and janine and the realtor can tell you what's customary for that area as far as option fee and that gives you a window of time and it used to be that it was 10 days option um, now we're seeing 
and, and I know Janine will probably hit on this, that maybe the option period uh, would be less because there's so many people wanting to buy that house. So in order to get your, your contract, your offer accepted, that may be one of the things that she would tell you. But um, so option period during the option, it would give you time to have that house inspected by a licensed inspector uh, just to see if there's anything wrong with the house, um, if there's any type of problem that you might not be able to live with. My cousin um, uh, made an offer on a house. Her offer was accepted. She deposited earnest money with the title company. She paid her option fee. During the option period, when she went to look for, uh, look, go uh, look at the house, take a better look at the house with the uh, in inspector, she found that there were some things, you know, that she wasn't sure that she could live with and that the repairs were going to probably be more than what she was willing to pay. So your agent's also going to negotiate what stays, what goes. They're involved with uh, things like, oh, you can have the refrigerator. Sometimes homeowners will say, well, I don't like this dining room furniture anymore. And so your, your, your agent can negotiate all of that. Is this a buyer's or seller's market? Um, uh, we are seeing that in most areas of the state of Texas, for example, it is a uh, seller's market, meaning there's a shortage of inventory. In my area, when I first came, I live in Central Texas, and I moved from San Antonio to be close to my mom in Belton, which is um, north of Austin, about an hour north of Austin. And so I found out what was the month of in, months of inventory, and we like to see six months worth of inventory um, for a balanced market. It was 0.7 months worth of inventory in my uh, county in Bell County. And so that told me, hey, I am in a seller's market and I'm, uh, I, I need to know that because there's limited inventory. In a buyer's market, uh, that means that there's a lot of availability and you have the advantage. So you're going to use comparable sales that your realtor gives you. Um, and they can also give you DOM, the days on the market, which is very important um, regarding the market history because the days in the market will tell you uh, how long does it take to sell a house on average in this particular neighborhood. Um, and so that's a really good number for you, for you to have. Uh, ridiculous offers can offend the seller, especially if you are in the seller's market. So you need to think about how much you're willing to spend and your realtor is going to tell you what the trends are showing. I know in Austin, Texas, um, they're paying like $100,000 over the list price, which I think is pretty ridiculous. I'm not sure I would be able to do that. But uh, so you want to know what kind of market you're in and, and make your offers according to that. What are fixtures? Fixtures are items that are permanently attached or built into the home, such as your light fixtures, ceiling fans. Um, and your contracts will have contingencies. Um, the promulgated contract for the Texas Real Estate Commission, a one to four family uh, contract, already has contingencies in that contract, such as obtaining financing. So when you make an offer and you sign that contract, you're basically saying, I'm going to do my level best to obtain financing. And if you don't do that, then you are subject to loss of your earnest money. We had a gentleman that um, didn't give us his pay stubs and his bank statements, and that uh, uh, caused us to give him a denial. And but we were not; he was not; he lost his earnings money because he didn't get he didn't give us what he was supposed to give us. Sometimes there'll be uh, problems with the appraisal or the survey. If we get an appraisal back and it's, let's say your house um, that you wanna buy, it's $300,000 house, it appraised at 280, um, then there's a contingency in that contract that you can get out of the, you can get out of the deal. You can get out of the contract and get your earnest money back. You can also add a contingency that such as that you're selling a current residence um, and as soon as that house sells, then you'll purchase this new one. So what is earnest money? Earnest money is an amount of money that indicates that your offer is serious. So you're mo trying to motivate the seller to consider or accept your offer and your realtor will have a good idea of what a uh, earnest money is customary for your area. And so we used to say 1% of the sales price. 
Um, but that can be different depending on the neighborhood and depending on what the market trends are at that particular time. So um, your agent will advise you as to how much earnest money is acceptable. If you're getting a lot of offers rejected, then your realtor may ask you to increase your earnest money. Um, and that money is deposited with the title company. And if the deal should fall through and you have done everything that you're supposed to do, then you get your earnest money back. So um, it is forfeited if you default on the contract. So just because a property doesn't appraise out doesn't doesn't mean that you lose your earnest money. It is held in what we call in escrow with the title company. Um, so please don't, you know, let's just say you want to buy a house from a friend and um, you, you, you know, give the earnest money to, to the, to the seller. That's not a good idea. Even if you're buying a house from, from what we call for sale by owner, you need to have a title company involved. Every single time your check should be written to XYZ title company. Uh, we did have a gentleman, I had a gentleman that uh, I was trying to help him buy a house and he wrote his earnest money check to the seller there. And then there had a dispute. They had some type of problem and the deal fell through. And of course, he was not able to get his earnest money back. So you want to be very careful and make sure you deposit that with the title company. Uh, you take possession upon closing. Um, sometimes you can uh, close your loan and maybe this the you can or prior to closing, you can lease the property or you can close your loan and then lease it back to the seller if the seller's not ready to move. In my case, when my house was completed and the final inspection was done, um, final walkthrough and the final inspection, I went to the title company four o'clock on Friday, signed all the documents. They gave me a closing disclosure, a certified copy of closing disclosure. I then took that to the sales office and they gave me the keys to my house. So let's talk about protecting you. That's what we want to do here. So everything needs to be in writing. So this is some information and protection for you. Uh, if they say they're going to give you a, you know, uh, the couch or they're going to give you the refrigerator or they're going to give you the curtains, that does need to be in the non-realty addendum that the realtor will complete. So that's got to be in writing or it's not, it's not legal. Uh, seller's disclosure. This is very important. Sellers are required to disclose anything and everything that um, could be wrong with that house. And you need to be sure that you read the seller's disclosure. Um, there's a lot of liability involved with the seller. And um, when my house with San Antonio that I had in San Antonio, there's a lot of foundation issues in San Antonio. So I had my foundation fixed. I was very honest about that. Um, I was able to give documentation. So you want to make sure that you're getting the true picture of anything that might be wrong with that house. I highly suggest that you get an inspection. Inspections are not required. You don't have to do it. Uh, but I think it's a real good idea. And if you're buying a brand new house, there's basically three parts to the inspection. You do a foundation, a rough out plumbing inspection. Then there's a pre-sheet rock, a framing inspection and then of course you have your final inspection and I had that on my house even though it was new um, it, because I just it made me feel more comfortable to have that done just gave me and it wasn't very expensive home warranties are really important if you can get a home warranty um, it used to be very customary for uh, sellers to offer home warranties that would cover uh, the appliances or pools and so you want to make sure that your realtor is giving you the information on what type of home warranties are available. So let's go a little bit deeper. Let's take a deeper dive on the um, seller's disclosure. So the seller is required to disclose to you any material fact that would affect a decision to buy. So you really need to read the seller's disclosure. If it has lead-based paint, if it's uh, the house has as, asbestos shingles. Now, I will say that if it has lead-based paint and asbestos, in most cases, the lender won't be able to lend on it and those houses will have to be remediated. So it's not real common to see that. If it has foundation issues, then um, you need to know about that. If it has ever had foundation issues, it would be illegal for the seller to sell it to you without telling you 
if it had any kind of conditions uh, or repairs that you would need to know about, such as maybe there's sinkhole in the back, maybe there is a uh, mold, uh, maybe the house flooded. If the house got flooded, they must tell you about that. So if it's a new roof, um, you want to get a copy of the, the the contract or some type of documentation that shows it was new for and when i saw my house i had that i had um, a copy of the documentation along with the warranty on the foundation i was able to provide information on when the roof was replaced um, i did not offer a warranty but if there is one you want to certainly um, you want to certainly read that and find out what they're going to cover so inspectors, how do you find a good inspector? So your agent's probably going to have three of them that they'll give you. Um, you can check the Better Business Bureau. You can uh, get on the American Society of Home Inspectors website. Uh, you can ask if they, you know, have E and O insurance, which is errors and omissions insurance, which is uh, insurance kind of like. Uh, it's mal sort of like malpractice insurance for home inspectors. They are required in the state of Texas to have E&O insurance. So what does that mean? That means that if they just miss something, uh, that you have an insurance uh, company that you can get some satisfaction or some remediation, some help from. Um, you're going to ask exactly what they were going, the inspector will inspect, ask if you can attend the inspection. I in attended my inspections and I learned a lot. Um, and then ask for references. I want to say that my experience has been that there's a lot of difference between inspectors. Some are better than others. Um, one inspector that I was named that I was given because I'm not well wasn't really from this area so I didn't know a lot of inspectors in this area he emailed me this inspector emailed me and he, he wanted me to sign a contract and that contract said that if there are any legal issues that come up any litigation that come up as a result of his inspection that I would pay his attorney's fees and I, I read that and I thought no that's not right you've got errors and omissions insurance so i very politely emailed him back and said sir i don't feel comfortable signing this i'm not going to sign this uh thank you very much and then i just moved on to a different inspector that uh, not only didn't make me sign anything he also uh charged less money so there's a difference between the fees that the inspectors charge. And so um, you want to make sure that you're not being gouged for the inspection fee. Now, the inspection is not an appraisal. The inspection is just um, where, the, is, is, is where they're going through the house. They're going to turn on the dishwasher. They're going to turn on the heater. They're going to turn on the air conditioner. They're going to walk the perimeter of the house. Uh, a lot of them will get on top of the house to look at the roof or they have Many times they'll have they have drones that go up and take pictures of what that roof looks like. So home warranties um, are great. They're insurance policies that cover you uh, anything from dishwashers to swimming pools. They're negotiable between the buyer and seller. Uh, I know your realtors all, all know home warranty companies. Some home warranty companies are a little bit better than others, so you maybe want to Google them and see what their reviews are. But they're great to have. If you're buying a house that is was built in 1992 and it has never had the air conditioning, the HVAC system, the heating system replaced, that can be quite pricey. So, it, or maybe they have the same dishwasher. Uh, you want to have a home warranty, and those are good for one year, and then the insurance company will give you uh, um, a, send you a letter that says, okay, um, if you'd like to renew this, here's what your coverage would be, and this is what the, the premium would be, the yearly premium. So we're almost finished here. Um, from start to finish, You, I would say it takes about 30 days. Um, you get pre-qualified uh, or pre-approved. Now, let's talk about the difference between pre-qualified and pre-approval. Pre-qualified is where you're going, normally you would go on um, online and you would apply online and you tell us what you're making, tell us what your um, assets are. 
uh, what you're what you're bringing home um, and we do a credit report and so based on the information that you gave us we give you a prequal letter well the realtors know the difference between prequal and pre-approval and amy can talk about the uh, uh, a little bit more about uh, exactly what that means but pre-approval that's where you have supplied your pay stubs and your bank statements and sometimes an underwriter will have looked at that loan and um, giving you a pre-approval letter. So that's what the difference is there. Once you get that and you know how much house you can afford, then you're gonna be finding a house your realtor is gonna be working with you to negotiate the contract. You can't lock the interest rate in, until you have an earnest money contract, until you have a deal, until you ha have had your contract accepted. Uh, I know interest rates have gone up, but we still are looking at historically low interest rates. Um, when I got out of college in 1983, we were making loans for home homes and not just our company, all companies at about 16 percent. So we're still looking at historically low interest rates right now. So it's a great time to buy. You're researching your insurance and, and there's a lot of disparity between insurance companies. So once you have found the house that you wish to purchase, you can call your insurance agent, give them the address, and, and start negotiating. Um, interestingly enough, the insurance company, big, huge insurance company that I have been with for 40 years, was not the best homeowner's insurance. Um, so I was able to work with a, an insurance agent company that is also a big company that my um, was giving me name was given to me by uh, the uh, by the lender. And um, I got a better deal. Um, so there's going to be differences between your deductible. My insurance company didn't even tell me they were going to charge me um, the same. Well, actually, it was a little bit higher for a $5,000 deductible. So meaning if anything goes wrong, I'm out $5,000 cash myself. Well, I was able to get a better policy with a $1,000 deductible with a lower monthly premium. So there's a lot of difference um, between in insurance companies. And so that can take some time to research your insurance. So begin starting to research your insurance as soon as you know you're going to buy that house. Get it inspected. Uh, the inspector may find some things that need to be repaired, which would require your realtor to renegotiate that contract uh, or renegotiate, uh, ask for some repairs. Uh, the appraisal comes in. Um, the appraiser may have some what we call lender required repairs that might require a reinspection. And then we obtain clear title to the property so that we make sure that there's no liens and encumbrances on that property. There's no long lost relatives that could claim title to it. And then we order a survey because we don't want to order a survey until we know that the property is appraised out because that uh, it's a charge we wouldn't want to have to charge you unless, unless we knew for sure uh, it appraised out. So verifications, we re-verify you, that you have the cash to close. Uh, we re-verify your employment and then we recalculate your uh, debt ratio and that is your debt as a percentage of your gross monthly income, your monthly, your principal interest tax and insurance, your total payment and your other obligations such as your car payment, uh, any maybe uh, installment loans that you might have, your monthly minimums on your credit card and then your total housing payment in and divide that into your gross monthly income. So once you get pre-qualified initially, try not to go out and charge a lot on your credit cards or try not to um, you know, take out any credit cards because every time you in, uh, apply for a new credit card or a new um, credit at all, that's gonna hit your credit two to three, two to three points. Um, so First Mark Credit Union has this great benefit and it's called Blend Realty where you have an integrated digital experience where you're having a home, you have a concierge that once you apply that concierge is going to walk you through the process and help you. If you have a problem with your realtor, then the home buyer concierge is going to assist you with that particular problem. Any type of problem that you have, you have this benefit. Um, and the agents, as I said, that the their top quality realtors, uh, real estate agents that have been scrubbed, they have they are experienced, and we've worked with them before. Um, 
So Blend Realty really has this great team to help you. I'm very, very uh, impressed with it. And it just takes the home buying process to a new level. Um, we get a lot of five-star ratings and we do have a lot of uh, agents that have, um, and Janine in particular works a lot with um, uh, veterans in the community. So you start the home buying process with the credit union and this you sort of save time and, and stress by using this service completely free to you, uh, the Blend Realty. Um, you receive a closing cost credit to minimize um, your out-of-pocket expenses, which is quite significant that um, that you would be getting this credit towards your closing costs. So it's just a one-time, just like one-stop shopping where you have this network of uh, people and agents and loan officers and uh, we're all partnering together to make sure that you have a really good experience. And that's what I like about it because that's what we're here for is to, to make sure you have a good experience. Um, as I said, you could call the concierge anytime for any concerns along the way. Uh, and then you have three agents that you can pick from. So it's a pretty seamless process. It's just a team that is working for you every day to make sure everything goes well. And this, you get 0.6% credit towards your closing costs, which is quite significant. So the uh, median sales price in Texas, I believe, is, is uh, 305. 305 and so if you had a if you were buying a house for three hundred thousand dollars 0.6 percent of that would be eighteen hundred dollars towards your closing costs so that's a really significant savings for you let's david can we turn it over to you and your and see if anybody has any questions oh we've got a lot of questions excellent presentation tammy thank you I think uh, you answered a lot of the questions that we received that came in as our attendees registered, but I want to go through and we've got some other ones that probably could uh, also be uh, answered by Amy and Janine. And so, uh, Amy, you know, uh, a lot of our borrowers want to know, like, if I'm a first time home buyer, what what do I need to do to where do I get started with all of this? You know, Tammy talked about always starting with the application process and then uh, getting some more information and support from you. Can you explain that a little bit to us and how how you go about helping our borrowers? Yes, absolutely. Hello, everyone. So the very first place to start, just like Tammy said, is with your financing. The worst thing and I hate hearing it, when people go to a home, fall in love with a home, they make an offer on the home, and then they try to get their financing and they're not able to be approved. So everything kind of falls apart from there. So it's always best to start with your financing. Um, I want to be available to you to help you understand the entire process. Basically, you're going to complete an online application. The application will include a credit pull. We will take the information that you've provided as it relates to your income and your assets, the money that you have saved, and we can help you determine how much you qualify for, or maybe you have a monthly payment budget in mind. And then I can tell you, okay, then that would be a house that costs this much um, so we can we can talk about all of that but it really does start with reaching out to me for your financing and completing an online application and then i'll walk you through the whole process amy two follow-up questions on those uh, one is like does when they apply does it affect their credit score at, at the application process and then another one is uh, kind of follow up to that once they apply how long is their current rate locked for and then do they need to reapply okay so when your credit is pulled anytime your credit is pulled for any kind of financing any kind of debt if you will um yes it is considered an inquiry and it is a what what is classified as a hard hit to your credit score there are different schools of thought 
as it relates to how many points it pulls your score down. I don't really think anyone knows the official answer to that. <laughs> it's it's a it's a broad picture of what you're doing. If you're applying for a car and a credit card and furniture and a mortgage all in the same week, you're going to have a harder hit to your credit score than someone that's just applied for a mortgage and nothing else for the past two years. So yes, it does impact your credit score. I, I am not able to tell you to what degree um, it, as it relates to a number or a point. Um, some say it's two or three points. I truly do not know. Um, your pre-qualification, once you apply with us, is good for 120 days. It is good for four months. And at the end of four months, all we have to do is pull a new credit report. We don't have to start all the way over. It's just that the credit report is good for 120 days. And you are not locked in at pre-qualification. I can pre-qualify you today. We can have a conversation. We can talk about today's rates. We can talk about what your payment would be but I am not able to lock in your interest rate until you have a house under contract. The lock is tied to the property address. And when you are just getting pre-qualified, you do not, most in most cases, you do not have a property address yet. So you are not locked in at pre-qualification. Your rate will change. Excellent, thank you. Amy, and I'll just add that uh, one of the questions that we, uh, Amy and uh, had answered before on the attendees is like, well, you know, what's one of the best way to repair your credit report? Amy also works with our borrowers on that. And 35% is based off of your payment history. 30% is based on the amount you owe. 15% is late length of credit history. 10% is new credit and 10% and is types of credit used. So there, we'll, we'll be sending out the, the questions and the answers uh, with a follow-up email so you can, you can get that information. So Janine, it, it seems like uh, you got, from, from Tammy's presentation, you got a lot of work cut out for you, and I wouldn't see why <laughs> a homeowner would not want to get a realtor uh, to help them. So there, there was one question that we had, is it safe buying from a seller by owner? Uh, versus using a realtor. So if I want to go just to somebody that my next door neighbor that's selling their property and I want to buy it from them, you know, what is the benefit to me to get a realtor to help me with that? And I want to make sure you, uh, you've got your mic muted. There it is. There we go. Hi, David. Hi. Thank you, Tammy. That was very thorough. So the question about the for sale by owner, Typically, people that are for selling by owner are still willing to pay the realtor fees. A lot of time, they don't know the process. They don't have the forms. They can't answer the questions on the, the process from start to finish. So many times, it does benefit you to have a realtor. A, you want to make sure that the price of the home is in line with what the comps are, what the comparable properties are in the neighborhood. And then you really need a, a realtor to navigate through all of this, uh, especially with a for sale by owner. So they usually are willing to have the realtor come in and although they're representing the buyer, pay to navigate through the whole process. So it is still very important to have a realtor. Perfect, thank you. Tammy, do you mind uh, going to the next slide and we can show uh, some contact information for Janine. So well, I know we just have a few minutes left. I wanna make sure that you, know, you have contact information for Janine. I'll get a few more questions in here. Uh, this is her contact information on the next slide is Amy's contact information and we've got a QR code there for you so if you want to take a you know snapshot of that QR code that's to the application process that Tammy was talking about earlier that it's all integrated with one another when you go on there and you apply you're just having you can use your mobile just go on there and, and put in all the information from the comfort of your living room you actually if you don't have a realtor then you can say that you, you're not working with one and the concierge service will give you three top uh, rated realtors for you to choose from and then you can start working with one of those. Uh, so that's Amy's contact information and then Amy, uh, 
and a kind of follow up question to the pre qualification and pre approval. I think it, the question is, what is the difference between the pre qual and the pre approval? And is the 120 days the same for both of them? It is the 120 days is based on the age of the credit report. So whether it's pre qualification or pre approval, it still starts with a credit pull and that credit is good for 120 days. The typical average standard normal operating procedure is for people to be pre-qualified. That is what most people are. So what that means is you have provided information, you have completed an application, we're taking the information that you have given us, we are helping you determine your price point that you want to stay within and we say based on what you have provided this checks out this looks good this is great okay if i then ask you to give me pay stubs w2s bank statements i'm going to call your employer I'm going to take your file and I'm going to submit it to an underwriter. An underwriter is going to review everything. That is pre-approval. Those are two different things. And typically pre-qualification is where you begin. In this market, people are sometimes wanting pre-approval. And if that is something that is being asked of us, we can do that, but it is not what we typically do right from the start. For example, we might talk to 10 people. We're not going to send 10 people to underwriting because out of those 10 people, maybe five of them decide not to buy a house. So we wouldn't do that process. Um, so pre-qualification pre is your initial goal. Thank you. Janine, yeah. do you agree with that? I do, uh, especially in this market. It, it's, it's a tough competitive market. The conversations I have with buyers um, prior to the process is to be prepared. And I do agree. Pre-qualification is fine. But it, in this market, there's a lot less inventory, a lot more uh, buyers, buyers coming from all, all parts of the country. And so you really have to know how to how to win these listings and having that in place is really, really important. Yeah, so it is something we offer and we're never going to tell someone we will not do a pre-approval. It is just not what we typically do from the start. And Janine, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this seller's market that we're in. Uh, people just trying to find a home. It's It's been really tough, you know, and so, yeah. you know, do you have any advice for us that you would want uh, our borrowers to know, like, you know, when we're working with a realtor, I'm sure there's some some uh, many conversations, maybe late nights, maybe some crying, maybe some some <laughs> wine that's uh, just saying, I thought this was the house we were going to get. You didn't get it. So any it like advice or any tips that you would want to share with us? It's tough. It, it is. It's really tough. Conversations I have are different now than they were two years ago. Um, the inventory here in San Antonio is at 1.2 months. Um, our median home price is about 350. And now, be prepared because sellers are not paying some of the things that they used to, um, even as much as closing costs for the buyer. So buyers need to be prepared to come in with not only their down payment, but all of their closing costs that in a, in a market two years ago, the seller might wanna pay or be able to pay um, some of the seller closing costs. So some of these typical closing costs on the contracts that we've always put as seller costs are now buyer costs. And then obviously we're having some appraisal issues because we have a lot of people that are paying a lot over the sales price out of their pocket. And so that, that has to be a discussion that we have to have as well, because you do go out, put a lot of offers in, and then unfortunately you're not getting them. And so you have to kind of change the game. So I think just being prepared, um, realtors do have a way sometimes of getting houses that are not on the market yet. I mean, I market a lot to a lot of other realtors and I have ways to, to find certain neighborhoods, certain houses that are coming up because I know the area so well. So a lot of times I can find a, a house that is not yet listed. And that's really the way to go. Um, once it hits the market, there it's not uncommon for it to have 20, 30 offers and uh, gosh, that probably that many showings. So it's really, really tough right now. And just getting a realtor that really knows what they're doing. I mean, we can usually win, um, but you need to be prepared 
to put your best foot forward and and know that it's going to be a little bit more it's going to be a little bit higher right now to buy a house than than normal than a, than a normal market yeah i appreciate that janine i i know there are probably a lot more questions that we were unable to answer but we did take a list of all those we will send out an faq uh, in the next couple of days to the attendees and uh Tammy, if you can, if hopefully you guys could have taken Janine's contact information on here, and then if you can go to Amy's contact, Marissa, uh, I want to make sure that you get a chance to get Amy's phone number here. You can call her directly. Um, you can also use that QR code right there to apply if you're, you know, interested in getting pre-qualified. Just, you know, that's the first step to to getting your owning your home. So there's the process right there for you. And then if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Tammy, you know, I work with First Smart Credit Union and I'm also a contact, a point of contact, so you can reach out to me and I'd be glad to put you in, in contact with any of the, the experts that we had on our on our discussion today. So I appreciate y'all taking the time out of your, your evening. Tammy, that was an excellent presentation. We got a lot of great insights. Thank you, Amy and Janine, for doing such a wonderful job with our borrowers and we appreciate everybody attending tonight. So y'all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy Bye -bye. it.